The viewpoints expressed on Night Fright are not necessarily those of the host, the staff, the sponsors, or the affiliate stations. Tonight's program may contain graphic themes or images. Viewer discretion is advised. There is a time for question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Showtime. Welcome to the show. I am Brent Holland and welcome one and all to Night Fright. A riveting show tonight, folks. One that could be the script to a feature film. It's a story full of top secret documents, mystery, and intrigue. Kick back in your most comfy chair, get the coffee going, get the tea going, or a beverage of choice. Let me read this before we start tonight. Folks, during the closing days of World War II in Europe, two U-boat submarines secretly left ports and slipped beneath the freezing waters of the North Atlantic. One of those U-boats, number U-235, would end its journey in Argentina. Now, folks, rumor has it that that sub carried Hitler, of all people, to Argentina. The other U-boat, our focus tonight, number U-234, had a far different destination and a far different cargo. The sub, folks, was destined for Japan. Now, let's not forget the European War would end on May 8th, 1945. The war in Japan, however, would rage on for another four full months until September 2nd, 1945. The cargo contained on that submarine was essential to the Japanese war effort, and it also had, are you ready folks, the potential of making the Axis powers now that was Germany, Japan, and Italy, victorious and rulers of the world. The history books say, folks, that the Nazis were not even close to creating a nuclear weapon, and the U.S. were the only country capable of creating them. Now, according to our guest tonight, Carter Heydrich, and his book Critical Mass, those history books are very very wrong. Let me give you a hint of where we're going to go tonight. In July of 2011, 126 barrels of spent uranium from the Nazi atomic bomb program was reported to have been discovered. Don't go anywhere tonight, folks. We're going to take a look at just how far along the Germans really were with their nuclear program Researcher and writer Carter Plimpton Heydrich is considered by many the leading expert on the history and the surrendering of U-boat 234 and its cargo of enriched uranium, which he tracked into the Manhattan Project and the Hiroshima bomb. Carter, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. This is an incredible story. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. I appreciate being here um, for the invite and also, uh, now, just real quickly, you said 126 barrels of spent uranium were found? 126,000. Yes, it was 126,000 barrels. So I did the calculations on that, and that's conservatively over 300,000 tons. So that's huge. Huge. Anyway, yep. Yeah. It's, a, it's Like I said, it's an incredible story, and it's one I was not aware of. Now, what exactly was the cargo on board submarine U-234? 
uh, U-234 is a pretty interesting submarine. It had a whole bunch of Germany's highest value, high technology. Uh, had the uh, Messerschmitt 262, the first jet that was used in combat. Had a Henschel high atmosphere uh, airplane, uh, pressurized cockpit. It had, um, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, it had the plans and parts to the V-4, which the, was the precursor to the intercontinental ballistic missile. But the most important thing, and I think you really want, you want me to get to, is it had 560 kilograms, which is about 1,120 pounds of, of enriched uranium. Now, the, the traditional history says it was raw uranium, but my research shows that it was enriched uranium. And I have uh, Delmar Bergen, who is the uh, director of the nuclear weapons program at Los Alamos, has come out in my book, endorsed my book. He wrote the forward to it, at least uh, the third edition. This is actually the third edition that just came out this month. He wrote the forward to it, and he is very, very clear that it was was enriched uranium. Could have been nothing else. Now, um, you say Delmar worked over on the Manhattan Project. In what aspect was he working, and where was he working? He he started his career and, and actually maintained his career in the nuclear uh, weapons programs throughout the, his career there. But he ended up for the last, I think he told me, eight or nine years as the director of the nuclear weapons program. So he ran the nuclear weapons program for the United States. So he was down in New Mexico then working side by side with Oppenheimer and all the rest of the... He, he wasn't that early. He, he, uh, he didn't actually start working at Los Alamos until... Um, I think he said 53. So he was after the fact, but he, he worked with all those guys who worked, I shouldn't say all of them, he worked with those who were still in the program after the war and knew them and heard their stories and, and uh, you know, but he, he didn't actually work on the bomb. He didn't work there during the war itself. <clears throat> okay, let's go back to the submarine and its most important content, the uranium. Was that enough of uranium? for the Japanese to potentially make some kind of nuclear atomic bomb or something along those lines, what we would call today a weapon of mass destruction? It was. Um, Dr. Bergen has stated clearly, and he states in the foreword that, that uh, he believed that the uh, Nazi scientists who sent it were sending what they believed to be the amount to at least make one atomic bomb. He's He's very clear that it was enriched uranium. What he does say is, is that he's not sure what it was, level it was enriched to. Um, the stowage of, of how the uranium was packed, it was in, uh, according to United States Navy uh, documents that are in our U.S. archives that I found, um, and these are documents other historians have found as well, and, and, and they quote them in other books, but they've never made the correct interpretation of them. Um, but according to, to one of the main documents, it said that the uranium was stowed in gold-lined cylinders, that it was uh, would be sens sensitive and dangerous when opened, and it should be handled like crude TNT. Natural uranium is, you know, Dr. Bergen said it's about as dangerous as mud. It's not as, you know, you wouldn't do any of that stuff. You could actually one of the um, Another person who endorsed my duck book was a, a gentleman by, by the name of Dr. Gary Sandquist, who was a uh, instructor of nuclear engineering at West Point. And he, uh, when I was talking to him about it, it, as part of the research of the book, I said, "Are you sure it's enriched?" He said, "He said, it. You can't be absolutely positive, but it's like building a wine cellar, a really nice wine cellar, to hold the, all the greatest wines and storing Kool-Aid in in it." You would do it, you could do it, but would you? It just doesn't make any sense financially. It's just idiotic. So so they're both, and uh, not only those two, but there's others, Dr. Bernard Waring at the uh, at the University of Texas uh, Nuclear Research Center, John Poston, head of nuclear engineering at Texas A&M. They all say, yeah, I was enriched uranium. Not only that, but the, um, the uh, ra chief radio operator on the U-boat, a guy by the name of Wolfgang Hirschfeld, he actually wrote in his memoirs, in both the German and English versions of this, his memoirs, that he observed the uh, crates of uranium being brought onto the U-boat and having, there was two Japanese officers who were accompanying the materials to Japan to make sure they got there. 
and th these these boxes, and they were described as being nine inches square. So you're talking about something that's about the size of your face, you know, <laughs> for those who are watching. You're very <laughs> generous because really this face is probably 30 inches wide at this point. No, I'm just kidding. I wasn't talking about your head. I was just talking about your face. No, just... <laughs> anyway, the, um, the boxes were nine inches square, but it took two men to carry them, and their, and their knees were drooping. They were so heavy. Well, uranium's the most heavy material on Earth, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the only way something that heavy is going to be that heavy in a nine-inch nine square box. But they, they brought these boxes to the uh, uh, Japanese officers, and then they would paint on the side of the boxes. They were painting U-235, okay? That identifies it as enriched uranium because U-235 is the isotope of uranium you're trying to enrich to to create a bomb. So we have circumstantial evidence that says due to the how it was stowed, and there's another document that has more information about that. It was enriched uranium, and then we have an eyewitness report who in two different documents says it was enriched uranium. The last document talks about um, it's actually a transcript between two uh, uh, Manhattan office and t uh, Manhattan Project intelligence officers, and uh, they described that the cylinders that the uranium were actually in, there was 80 of them, and um, and they were in cylinders. So the fact that they were in cylinders, the geometry helps to minimize um, criticality, so you don't have a basically a dirty bomb. Because if they packed them in square packs side by side, you would have the ability to create a chain reaction to sustain a chain reaction, be a slow chain reaction, but it'd still be lethal. The other thing that the other thing they said when they talked about 80 cylinders, if you divide 560 kilograms by 80, you get almost exactly half of critical mass, which would have been a logical uh, amount to put them in. So you didn't, you weren't getting close to critical mass in any content. A particular container. So there's all kinds of evidence it was enriched. I want to try and find out if this would have been a game changer. I'm curious both on how far along the Germans were with their capabilities and also Japan, if this was the missing ingredient for Japan. And I'll tell you where I'm going with this. If Japan was able to beat the United States to a weapon of mass destruction of that caliber, and we already know that, um, as you said, they were working on the V-4, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that was called the New York uh, missile uh, yeah. because they wanted to take out New York with it. So this was a long-range uh, ICBM, if you will, folks. Uh, they wanted to release it over in Germany and have it be able to take out New York. I mean, we were really getting there. These weren't the V-1s that were just falling ad hoc on top of London. So there was a delivery vice that was very, very capable of <coughs> delivering a nuclear weapon or an atomic weapon. Germany's capabilities we'll start with, and then we'll go to Japan's. Okay. I was going to say you opened about 10 doors in, the, in, in, <laughs> in those few se sections. So I'll follow the ones you tell me to, to go through. So okay. Germany, um, Germany was very close to having a, a, um, a nuclear weapon. It might be helpful to your audience. I know they're a pretty, pretty uh, well-informed audience, but just to lay the groundwork so everybody, everybody knows. The traditional history of the Manhattan Project is that the United States, pretty much alone, had a little bit of help from some European immigrant scientists who came to the U.S. and worked within the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project created both the uranium bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and the, and the plutonium bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. Um, that is all part of the traditional history. Part of the traditional history, it's a footnote, but includes about U-234 being surrendered and the, and, the, and the uranium on it and all the other stuff. There's been books written about that, and it's accepted in that, in that form. Where I differ is in, as we've talked about already, identifying that enriched uranium. Well, if the, obviously, to answer your question directly, obviously, if the Germans had enough enriched uranium that they could provide 560 kilograms, which Dr. Bergen is confident was, in, depending on the enrichment, even if it was only enriched to 10%, if it was run through a, a calutron one more time or any kind of electromagnetic device, it would have gotten up to 75, 80 bomb grade uranium. And there would have been enough for at least one bomb. If it was really already high grade, it, there would have been enough for 
um, 10 bombs, right? 11 bombs. Excuse me. So, so Germany had done the hard part of creating a uranium bomb. They had enriched the uranium. The way to trigger a uranium bomb is you take a high velocity can and you put one slug of the enriched uranium over here with a hole in it the size of the other slug and you just shoot that that slug into the other slug and it happens fast enough that it creates the nuclear explosion. Well, you got to believe Germany had high velocity cannon. We know they used them all the time. So that wasn't an issue. They could have triggered it. And I always, when I, when I give my presentation, and I should share with you, I have given this presentation at Los Alamos and Oak Ridge wow. twice each. Now, the first time I went, they both said, oh, we're not sure, you know, you're going to survive this. And I'm like, well, I'm here for critical review. There's no better place to get it. And when I was done, I presented for an hour, and there was Q&A for an hour. Sold out every book I had all four times, and, uh, you know, it was a smashing success in both places. Um, so the evidence is compelling. But I always got two questions, and one of them, the first one was always, if the Germans had enriched uranium, they would have used it in a bomb on America or England or somebody. They didn't use it, therefore they didn't have it. That's always been one of the two key responses to my evidence, <clears throat> my research. And my response to that is easy. By the time they had the enriched uranium, they didn't have control of the skies anymore. They'd lost superiority in the right. skies. So they had invested roughly what we invested in our nuclear programs, $2 billion. That's, US, that's a $1945, so make it $25 billion or whatever the you know, rate is. That is a lot, a big investment and a strategic investment to try to um, to sneak in on somebody, and that the, the risk was too great. It was too, they couldn't have got it to a, strategi a strategic target that was worth that investment. So what I think happened, what I think I show in the book, is that instead they negotiated it to the United States at the end of, of, of the war, and that's how we got it. So. So that kind of answers your first question, how were the Germans doing? They were very close, and, if they, and they probably could have and would have used it if they hadn't lost control of the skies. Do you think part of the problem there was the fact that they had no industrial capabilities left either to mass manufacture not only um, the delivery of the V-4s, but also to mass manufacture the, um, the aircraft? The, uh, yeah, my, my answer just now was, was predicated on a on an aircraft, an airplane delivery, a lumbering bomber trying to get to a strategic. Okay. Yeah, they were gone. Yeah, yeah. they were gone. They didn't have that. The the and the the V two. The V two obviously had been used. They had the V one, which was just a buzz bomb. They had the V two as a, was an actual rocket. The guidance system was very rudimentary on it. It was preset before it went and and it landed wherever it landed, and it was almost as quirky as the V1 in terms of where was it going to hit. The V4, they had the plans for and parts for, but they hadn't fully assembled and used one, tested one or anything. So they didn't know what was going to, what was going to be the outcome of that. Mm -hmm. However, they did, and I cover this in, in my book, there, a couple, there was a couple of passengers, there were several passengers on U-234 besides the crew and the Japanese officers. Um, one of them was a guy by the name of General uh, Ulrich Kester, who was the head of the um, Luftwaffe, and then he was going to Japan to be the air attaché. Another one was a man, um, I lost his name. He was a, a Nazi party judge, but he knew the background. Of the, both of them, <clears throat> excuse me, in their interrogations after the war, or after at least being captured, um, both of them shared how the... Uh, the rocket program of Germany had had experimented with putting cockpits in these rockets. Yeah. Okay, they didn't yet have the uh, guidance systems to actually operate them. But think of this, and they actually said this in their, in their interrogations. They put they had put the cockpits in. They in fact had a, a fully assembled high altitude cockpit in U-234 going to Japan. And they said that the idea was to use kamikazes to pilot the rockets to um, 
to get it to a strategic part uh, uh, target. So it was really, strategically, it was a pretty good marriage to take Germany's uh, uh, weapons, their technology, and take Japan's, I don't know what you call it, craziness, their, 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 their willingness to put a kamikaze a, a, and, and let him take his life and he'd be a hero, you know, if he, if they'd have done that. So the idea, the I think, wind. Yeah. yeah, the idea, I, I, I think, or at least you have to think that that's what's a logical thing to do was to put the cockpits in a, in a, in a V4 and send them over. They didn't have any German pilots that were willing, that were as frenzied as, as the Japanese did that would do that. So they're sending them to Japan. And like you said, and I think astutely so, had the, um, had the Japanese been able to use the weapon, uh, they would have won the war, um, and they, Germany would have risen out of the battlefield ashes like a phoenix because they had that alliance that provided the technology. And, uh, you know, like a, 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 at that point, I think one half of the hemisphere would have been ruled by, fundamentally ruled by Germany, and the other half by Japan. So, um, what was your next question? My, well, I was just trying to find out how far along the capabilities were in Japan as well as in, in Germany. We know the capabilities were somewhat stymied in Germany because of the bombings. So it was very difficult. They had, didn't have the money or the infrastructure left to mass produce these weapons. So in my, my, my mind, there was still enough infrastructure left in Japan that they were shifting these weapons over there for kind of a last stand, a last gasp attempt. I think uh, they were shifting the weapons over there. I don't think Japan in and by itself, and even even with the drawings and everything, I'm not sure they would have had the technology. You have to remember Japan at that time wasn't anything like Japan at this time. Most of their war crime industry was moms and pops in their garages of their house, you know, building by hand bullet casings or shell casings, whatever it was. A lot of that was done that way. Uh, um, they didn't become the super technology power until after after the war. So it would have been very hard to have any kind of install any kind of standards that were strong enough to really handle these technical devices. But the other thing is, like I said, there were there were the parts and plans. A lot of the materials for those going from Japan from Germany that had been built by the Germans, and they were also sending German technicians. So besides the general and his three or four man retinue. There were also uh, a couple of civilian engineers and another guy by the name of Hein Schlicke, who hopefully we'll talk about as we get a little further down. Uh, he was a full-blown doctored scientist um, and, and a mysterious kind of guy, and, and he's interesting in there, too. But they had all these personnel on the U-boat that, that were capable. If Japan wasn't capable of actually doing the technology, they had the raw materials and presumably um, – could have made what was left that needed left that was uh, wasn't on the the U-boat once the U-boat arrived with the help of the German technologists that were, were with them. Any idea if Japan was cognizant enough to know that uranium is potentially um, even by itself? I'm thinking of a dirty bomb, and you would mention the kamikaze aspects. You know, you've got a couple of kamikazes crashing into aircraft carriers virtually carrying uh, a death sentence with them in terms of small amounts of uranium. Was there any evidence that you came across that this might have been a potential use? Uh, not really. I, I did a little bit of study on, on Japan. I was really more focused on the German because that's, you know, what came to my attention was, hey, there's uranium on this U-boat and it doesn't, yeah. despite what everybody else says. It's, and, and, you know, the I, Germans... I'm a scientist, but it doesn't look like natural uranium. We're going to get to Auschwitz, and, and, folks, the Germans just kept ledgers and ledgers and ledgers of, of information on everything. They documented everything. So when somebody tries to tell you the Holocaust didn't happen, yeah. just look at the documentation. We'll get to Auschwitz in a second, but please continue. Uh, uh, if you uh, to, answer, uh, to answer your question about the Japanese and their nuclear knowledge, um, the... They, act, they were aware of uranium and what its capability was. They did have a nuclear weapon program called EFCO. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you, uh, you might pick up uh, Robert Wilcox's uh, Japan Secret War. He covers that pretty well, uh, if you want to know more about that. Now, his, his take on it is a little more optimistic than mine is on what they were technologically able to do. Um, 
he thinks he actually did build a bomb. I don't think there's enough evidence to, to, okay. to prove that. Um, and I think he says they tested a bomb, which I think they may have done, but it may have been a German bomb because there was at least two other U-boats that went ahead to Japan that weren't stopped uh, by the U.S. So, so, and we don't know what was on those specifically. So, so there's some gray areas in there, but Japan did did have an understanding. Whether they tried to make a dirty bomb or not, I I don't know. I don't. I haven't seen any evidence of it. Okay. Carter, um, would Hitler be cognizant of this thing? Would he sign off of, on it? Now, we know that uh, I think they slipped out of port um, U-234 on April 15th. Hitler was committed suicide on April 30th, just 15 days later. Do you think he would be advised that this is what's taking place? Yeah, the, the, the U-boat actually slipped out on April, April 16th. Um, you're pretty close one day. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Um, but obviously, if the U-boat already had all the parts and plans and everything in it before it slipped out, it takes you know weeks to load a U-boat. Um, sure. So there was a lot going on in my book. But even before that, in my book, let's back up a step and 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 talk the traditional history. Once again, we'll talk traditional history, and I'll try and tell you where I break off. Okay. Uh, the traditional history is that the Germans tried to make it enriched uranium, started out trying to enrich uranium. They made a fatal calculation on what moderator to use, didn't use graphite like we did, which would have been very easy, and tried to go with um, heavy water. Yes. Uh, hold on a second, I'm mixing up my theories. I got so much in my head sometimes I get mixed up. Anyway, the, the traditional history is that, the, yeah, they tried to go with heavy water. Yeah, the Netherlands. The history is that that didn't work well at all, but that was where they tried to, tried to focus on. And that was in the plutonium bomb project. And so, and that was Heisenberg and von Weizsäcker right. and all these guys that you read about that were the failure of the German bomb. Well, like I said at the head of the show, there's two ways to make a bomb. One's plutonium, the other one's uranium. They don't talk about the German uranium bomb. German uranium bomb, there was a guy by the name of Carl, uh, 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 Baron Manfred von Ardenna, who um, is in the traditional history is known to have created a, a uranium enrichment device similar to our calutrons, but he got to it earlier than we did, and it was four times more efficient than ours. Oh. Um, and there's no indication that, that they eventually bombed his laboratory, but not until uh, a couple of years after he had got to that point where he had where. When we were at that point that he was, way before they bombed this thing, we had actually taken the experimental piece and put it into production at, at Oak Ridge for the enriched uranium, right? Mm -hmm. There's no reason to believe he didn't do that. And in fact, there's plenty of evidence that that's what happened, was that the enriched uranium went into uh, production. To answer specifically your question whether Hitler knew about it, there's a book out called um, Hitler's Table Talk. It's written by a guy by the name of Henry Pickering. And uh, he documented how Hitler visited von Erdena's laboratory multiple times, multiple times. He never visited Heisenberg's laboratory. He never visited any other laboratory. The only laboratory he visited that we know that was related to nuclear weapons work was von Erdena's, and he went multiple times, which means something was pro progressing. He wouldn't have gone back to see the same thing over and over again. Some, nobody's going to waste the time doing that. He got to come, come see what we're what's happening now. So so there's there's evidence, plenty of evidence. And in fact, uh, von Ardenna, after the war, was captured by the Russians. And the R Russians didn't have any kind of a serious program at all. But within four years, they had a, a, a uranium-enriched atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. And it, and they credit, they credit von Ardenna with being the father of their atomic bomb. He was given the, the order of Stalin or Lenin um, for doing so, so there's plenty of evidence that the that that uh, the Germans did enrich uranium, and that that Hitler was very aware. Now, I talked about how the uh, uranium went from uh, from von Ardenna's laboratory, and he would have the next step would have been to productize it to make it into a product, right? Mm -hmm. He von Ardenna. All right, the next the next thing that happens is. In my book, I show where the directors of IG Farben, IG Farben had a plant at Auschwitz 
um, that was actually manned, much of it was manned by the forced labor there, concentration camp victims. Uh, but they also had uh, exported from Germany into Auschwitz, I think it was 25,000, no, it wasn't that many, with 8,000 uh, scientists and technicians and, and to run what was ostensibly a synthetic rubber plant, synthetic rubber called Buna. Um, it was in existence for four years before the end of the war, uh, but the directors of I.D. Farben who built the plant said during their interrogations in, uh, uh, prior to Nuremberg that the, uh, and there's, that the Buna plant never created any Buna, even though it was in existence for four years, but that it consumed as much electricity as the city of Berlin, which was the eighth largest city in the world. Now, what are they doing if they're consuming that much power, but they're not making anything, right? Exactly. I looked at that and I said, "That's there's something wrong with that. And I started looking at electromagnetically, the calutrons, which was our form of enriching uranium, was used electromagnetic uh, power to separate the uranium. Electromagnetic separation takes vast amounts of Uranium, and in fact, Dr. Bergen again in, in his forward to the book says, you know, I don't. He, he basically he said, there's no way Buna takes that much power, but I can tell you from my own experience that's the kind of power you're talking about when you're enriching uranium. So we have here enriched uranium on a U-boat. It's labeled that way. It's packaged that way. I have several world-class physicists who say that's what it is. We have a a plant. And not within Germany, and intentionally not within Germany, because Germany was getting bombed, but in a prison plant, we're, we weren't bombing the concentration camps, right. so they put it in there, right? Yep. And so it's protected, it's hidden, it's supposed to be a Buna plant, it's got a perfect cover because it's allowed for the same kind of high pressure technologies. And chances of somebody sneaking out or surviving to tell the Allies that what was going on are very 30. slim. Yeah, one of seven people, I think, escaped from from. Uh, Auschwitz, not very many. Anyway, so the um, so we have an enriched uranium plant, circumstantial evidence, but very very strong. Try and convince anybody who. As a matter of fact, I have two Buna experts in the book who said when they when they looked at that evidence, they said that is not a Buna plant. They put they'll stick their their uh, reputations on it, and they're both high level presidents and vice presidents of polymer companies do what they're doing, talking about. And then we have what you mentioned at the top of the show, 126,000 barrels of spent uranium recently discovered in uh, salt mines in Hamburg. And this gets back to the other question, the other challenge I always received when I was presenting my, my research. People say, well, if you were right, there would be a massive amount of spent uranium somewhere, and it's not, they've never found it, so therefore it's not, it never happened. And that's why you're wrong. Um, and I always said, I've been saying for 17 years, it's out there somewhere. I don't know if it'll ever be found, but it's out there somewhere. We're on two, in July of 2011, it was discovered in Hamburg, like, like you said, 126,000 barrels, 300,000 tons of spent uranium. That is production level uranium waste. So all the pieces we need to show that the Germans had an enriched uranium program that was very, very successful are all in, all in place. Now, the historians are still... You know, the traditional historians are still fighting for their lives, saying, no, that can't be it. We know they didn't have this, we don't know. but I'm here to tell you, I've been studying this thing, started 25 years ago, and uh, I'm here to tell you that's, that's how it is. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first-person witness accounts. Order yours right now, nightfrightshow.com. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Was there any chance that the idea being that that particular submarine, U-234, would never make it to the shores of Japan, and it was always intended for those plans to fall into Allied hands as opposed to the Soviets? Uh, good questions. And my evidence doesn't show that it was always intended to go into U.S. hands. It looks like it was. It was probably the, the exchange technology exchange was a for real deal, and they were really trying to do it. As it became clear toward the end of the war, however, uh, that they weren't going to be able to deliver to use a bomb, 
Mm. And there was, it, it was questionable, it was risky whether or not they were going to get a bomb to Japan in time, get it built and used before not only Germany was rolled up, but Japan was rolled up as well, which effectively ended the war. So what my research shows is that a, a, a gentleman, I use the term loosely, a man by the name of Martin Borman, who your audience mm -hmm. probably savvy enough to know as well, uh, Martin Borman was the head of the Nazi party. So he was Hitler's right-hand man. We, you know, When you talk about World War II and you talk about Germany, you're as likely to use Nazi as Germany. Nazis ran Germany. That's right. At, uh, Hitler, way back in 1936, Hitler said, um, not 19, yeah, 1936, yeah. Hitler said that the, not, the party ruled the German government, not the other way around. That's right. Yeah. And that's how, how it operated. So mm -hmm. if you put that in that perspective, Martin Bormann is the head of the Nazi party. Short of Adolf Hitler, he's the most powerful man, not only in Germany, but in the whole Reich, right? Mm -hmm. And some say, and you know, so, so it in my book, some say Bormann even controlled Hitler, so that would make him the most powerful man. It's kind of immaterial because together they worked and they agreed and, and were doing the same thing. So Bormann, my research shows that Bormann... Um, actually decided somewhere in the process when he realized that the war, it was too risky to send that technology to, to Japan, the war would, may never get won that way. He, he decided that it would be a smarter move to take that strategic investment and deal it to the United States in exchange for his freedom mm. and, and, uh, and a small handful of people that were working with him because he had uh, basically, it's kind of involved to go through the whole process, but he had basically kind of pulled as much of the German economy as he could at the time. He told all the all the major German industri industrial firms, get all your, any kind of liquid assets you have, whether it's, whether it's currency, whether it's, um, uh, um, you know. All those things. I know Volkswagen yeah, was uh, involved I, at that big meeting, uh, the red something it was called. Yeah. Well, it was the uh, uh, the uh, as a council in Strasbourg, um, but yeah, Volkswagen was there, IG Farben, all the biggies, all the biggies were there. Bayer, all the biggies were there, and he yeah, basically, was... yeah, get all all, all your your uh, valuable currencies, whether it's uh, um, man, I'm missing the word, your licenses and and the intellectual yeah, intellectual reserves, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And he also told him, and by the way, hawk your company and all your assets to, for as much as you can, get as much hard currency, and put them into these 750 corporations I've created. And, and by doing that, he exported the economy of Germany into uh, neutral and friendly countries to Germany for after the war. So he, and so he dealt U-234 and the power to change the world, to control the world, to the U.S. in exchange for the U.S. saying, we will allow you to stay free, we will protect you and you're free, and allow him to to use that uh, that stealth economy that he had, had dispersed out throughout the world and bring it back into Germany and build up German, Germany quickly again, which is in fact what happened. Now they credit the Marshall Plan, um, but I think that's... I'm, that was almost just the cover. I think what really happened was was Borman just started feeding it back in. I think we're seeing the um, the consequences of a lot of those moves that were made, like Operation Paperclip, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Which brings up Von Braun. Do you think Von Braun was part and parcel? Did was he aware of any? I mean, with the V four going off, uh, the the plans for it, he must have known. I, I have to think he would have known that it was going somewhere. Yeah. Uh, um, and he probably knew where it was going. He was, of course, picked up and made a part of Operation Paperclip yeah. in a separate program that had, that dealt with rocketry. The other gentleman that I mentioned earlier, the scientist um, Heinz Schlicke, was picked up by Paperclip as well. Um, he was he was instrumental in our uh, bomb program because he was an expert in the. Uh, transfer of, of high quantities of energy quickly and simultaneously. That was his specialty. I, I talked earlier about the uranium bomb, mm -hmm. how they triggered that with a high-velocity cannon. They couldn't do that. Plutonium reacted too fast. 
So they had a huge problem, and it was a problem right up to the end of the war, uh, or right up to prior to when they tested the plutonium bomb at, at Trinity. The plutonium core that they used was about the size of a small grapefruit. They surrounded and cased it in six feet of high explosives, and then they put 32 detonators, but they couldn't get them to fire at the same time, so they thought, well, we'll duplicate it, so they put 64 detonators, and they still couldn't get them to fire at the, on at the same time. The idea was for those detonators to ignite that high explosive and compress that plutonium sphere to critical mass fast enough that it would explode, be the nuclear explosion. The problem they had is if you couldn't get all of those detonation points to detonate within, and Dr. Bergen, to, I put I put in a number, I think I put in one three thousandth of which I had read somewhere, and when he was vetting the book, uh, the first edition, he said, oh no, that's way low. I'm like, okay, what was it? He, goes, he says, I'm not sure I can tell you. And so I wasn't able to put it in the second edition, but he let me put it in the third edition. It was at one fifty thousandths of a second. All those, all those detonations had to go off within that, with that, that time frame. What would happen if one of them didn't go off that quickly, all the other ones would create this high pressure and there'd be this low pressure and it would just shoot the plutonium out. You'd essentially have a dirty bomb, but you wouldn't have the explosion, which is what they really wanted. So that was the challenge they had and right up to, to very close to when they did the Trinity test, they were still struggling with how to how to detonate his bombs. Matter of fact, it was such a problem that way back in October of 1944, they knew it was a problem. They'd been trying to solve it for almost two years. So Oppenheimer, who, as I'm sure your audience knows, was the head of the, the scientific head of Manhattan Project. General Gross was the head of the whole Manhattan Project. Oppenheimer assigned a three-man team to solve that problem. The first man on that team was a guy by the name of Luis Alvarez. When you read about Schlicke and U-234 in the surrender, there's an officer who's mentioned by Captain Fader, who is the captain of U-234, who's mentioned by General Kessler, who is the Luftwaffe general that I mentioned mm -hmm. with support. He mentions uh, a, light, uh, a light commander, uh, Alvarez. Captain uh, Fader mentioned a full commander, Alvarez. Um, and then there's a, a transcript of a lecture that Dr. Schlicke actually gave to the Navy and the preamble to the lecture says, you know, he's going to talk. Everybody be quiet. Don't ask any questions till the end. Then you can ask in the microphone. And uh, Mr. Alvarez will be able to handle the questions with, Ms. with Dr. Schlicke. So we have an Alvarez all over the, uh, as a handler to Dr. Schlicke. Well, Louis Alvarez, who was the one who Oppenheimer was put in charge of, of solving the timing problem, it's a hero of the Manhattan Project for t solving the timing problem, but he didn't have it. He didn't have it solved before U-234 landed, and he was there with with Schlicke. It could you, you might say, well, it's just a, a, a coincidence that you know there was an officer Alvarez who was dealing with with Schlicke, and and a Luis Alvarez who solved the problem that was closely related to what Schlicke did. You know, but I got into the uh, Navy uh, officers and and. Um, uh, warrant officer uh, directories for both 1943 and 1945. They printed every other year. And there is no officer by the name with the last name of Alvarez in the Navy, either in 1943 or, or 1945. So, uh, and General Groves is pretty open in his book now, it can be told about how he would give scientists the uniforms and ranks so that they could work with the military because the military was, he had the heebie jeebies about working with civilians. And so he was very open about it. Harlow Russ and his book, Project Alberta, talks about the same thing. And so it seems clear to me from the research in, in, that I put in my book that, that um, and it's clear to Dr. Bergen as well, that the uh, so, so solving the plutonium bomb problem issue was also solved by uh, some of the cargo that was on U-234. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the surrender, but I want to talk when we come back about Hitler as well, I just want to tell folks who we're speaking to, folks we're speaking with Carter Heydrich tonight, we're talking about a submarine that left Germany towards the end of the war and it contained uranium, as well as a lot of top secret projects that the Germans were working on at the time. It was destined for Japan, but it never made it. It ended up surrendering to the United States. And I think this is significant, and I'm gonna to get to that in a second. 
His book is called Critical Mass. Anybody interested in this subject matter, World War II conflict anywhere across the globe, will want this for their library without question. This is the real deal, folks. www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book cover. That'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home. www.nightfrightshow.com. Critical Mass is the name of the book. The author, Carter Heydrich. Carter, Hitler, you had mentioned Borman making a deal with the United States, and I think this is significant. As I'd mentioned at the outset of the show, there was another submarine, U-35, uh, 235, which is kind of ironic considering that that was the, uh, the uh, uranium's name, if you will. That's what they were shooting for. Any chance Hitler may have made a similar deal? Leave me alone? Apparently some FBI files have, who knows? You know, I don't, I, I, I've heard that. I've seen references to U-35. The only references to U-35 I've really been able to substantiate uh, in my own studies. And I have to, I have to tell you, my, the work that I've done has been totally focused on U-234 when I've, I've done. And the only reason I got into U-235 is because I was interested. You remember when I was talking about when uh, Wolfgang Spaler, the, yes. the uh, Wolfgang Herschel, the radio operator, saw them, the Japanese operators, uh, officers, painting U-235 on a boxes. He himself thought, well, that's strange. And so he went to the Japanese officers and he said, he said, um, what's, um, what, what's, what's going on? What's this about? And they said, oh, these are, are uh, this is cargo that was supposed to ship on U-235, but uh, it didn't make, it wasn't here in time. And so U-235 left. Um, but he, he knew something was wrong. He says mm -hmm. that. You know, he had seen them painting U-235 on it while they were sitting on U-234, and they were stowing it in U-234's tubes. So he was like, that doesn't make sense. So he goes to Failer, the captain of the of the U-boat, so, and explains what he says. And, and Failer basically says, pretend you didn't see anything. Don't talk to anybody about it anymore. Well, Fa <laughs> Hirschfeld, in, in his book, said, well, he wasn't real satisfied with that. So he went to the flotilla headquarters and asked him, he didn't talk about what he saw, but he said, you know, tell me about U-boat U U-235. And they said, well, U-235 is a school boat. It has never left uh, harbor and, and never will. <laughs> that was their uh, uh, explanation to him. Hmm. Now, I went one step forward. I wanted to, uh, because I had heard some of the other stuff that you referenced earlier about U-235, and I'm not, I'm not saying what's what. I'm just saying what I found. <laughs> what I found out. Uh, and I don't know if you've heard of a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Harry Cooper, who used to head up shark hunters. No, I haven't. I'm sorry. Uh, you might you might enjoy talking to Harry. Um, he runs Shark Hunters, which is an associ historical association that just is all about the history of U-boats. And uh, I, t I talked to Harry. He helped me a, a lot in my book with, with some stuff. And I talked to Harry about... Um, U-235, he says, hey, I've got a guy, there's a member of Shark Hunters who actually wrote his thesis on U-235. And I was like, I thought, oh, that's kind of weird given what Hirschfeld wrote about it. So, so I said, can I get a copy of it? He said, yeah, and they sent me the thesis. And it's weird, I don't know why he wrote a thesis on it, but basically his thesis basically agreed with what Hirschfeld said. That's what I've been able to find out okay. in any research I've done about U-235. Now, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they double named something or if they reused something or who who knows. Who but that knows? that's the research I got. The one the one other thing that, that Herschel did say from the from the Fatilla Commander no, it wasn't that. It was in the um it was in the uh thesis. Um it said that U-235 did go, at the very end of the war, that U-235 was commissioned to go out on a patrol and got sunk by its own patrol boats on its way out of the harbor hmm. <laughs> on its first maiden voyage. That, as far as I understand from research I could get, was the history of U-235, but I don't, I, I, I don't know how, you know. That's okay. That's what okay. The are. It was just speculation on my part. Yeah. More importantly, though, we do know that U-234 ended up surrendering to the Americans. Now, they had, 
they had a choice. They could surrender to the Canadians or the Americans. And this is why I think there was something more to them going to Japan than with what we've been led on. Now, maybe it's just my conspiracy <laughs> vibe. I don't know. But they had radioed Nova Scotia, Halifax Harbor, that they were coming in there as a, as a ruse. And they didn't want to surrender, from what I understand, Admiral Donitz, who took over from Hitler after Hitler committed suicide, folks, was in charge of Nazi Germany. He was the one that signed the surrender um, and ended the war, and he gave an order out saying that all U-boats should surface and surrender at the nearest port. So you, apparently, U-234 decided to surrender to the Americans because they didn't want to be arrested, they felt the Americans would send them back to Germany. Well, it, it, to me, that sounds like it's, it's bunk, because I think the Canadians would have done the same thing. They probably would have given them a toque and a hockey stick, too. So yeah. um, I, I think the reason why they surrendered to the Americans more than anything else was to make sure that what they had on board got to the Americans and perhaps not Great Britain and the rest of the Commonwealth. You're, you're exactly right. That's what that's what happened. And they when they they actually they Dernitz put out the order for all of them to surrender. They took I think three or four days deciding okay what they were going to do. In re, and that's the that's kind of a cover story because in reality there was other stuff going on. And I cover in the book in great detail. And there's too much detail to go through this. So I'm just going to kind of try and net it out. Um, but. Ultimately, uh, Fanner decided on May 12th to, through an open radio, he wasn't specifically trying to surrender to Canada, he just, on an open radio without any any uh, uh, encryption, just said, this is U-234, I'm here to surrender. Halifax said, okay, uh, give us your coordinates, and he gave coordinates which were not correct coordinates, and I cover that, that in the book, but he gave coordinates, I don't think he intend. I don't think he knew where the divisions were between if he surrendered in this part of the Atlantic, he had to go to the English. If he surrendered in this part, he had to go to the Canadians. If he surrendered in this part, he had to go to the United States. I don't think he understood where those demarcation lines were. Okay. So when he put over an open radio, I'm here to surrender, he was thinking the United States was going to say, okay, you know, come on in. But he was surprised. Nova Scotia said, you know, no, come, come here. Uh, or, yes, yeah, uh, Halifax, Halifax. Halifax, thank you. Halifax said, C come here to Nova Scotia to Halifax. And at that point, he even got more de devious, and he started sending false speeds and, and false directions, uh, false bearings. I cover it all in the books, kind of step by step. Like I said, it's way detailed. But he was very deceitful, uh, deceptive. And at the same time, Shortly after he started sending those, all of a sudden the United States started blocking all of his radio transmissions. They just aced out Canada flat out of it. And, and, and the USS Sutton, which is a destroyer that you two were surrendered to, got within visual range. And, that, and the Captain Nazro of the, uh, of the Sutton had his guys then communicate to you two thirty four through Morse code with signal lights. And he basically said, don't, don't talk to, to uh, Halifax anymore. Your ours and that and failure was fine with that because that was his original orders was to surrender to the U.S. anyway because this whole thing had to be as tightly secret as they could make yes. it because there was two if it got out that the United States had made a deal with Mar Mormon who at that point of time could have been Lucifer would have been Lucifer you know in everybody's mind and probably still is you know well that, the other thing that always stuck out in my mind too is that there was Luftwaffe. Um, uh, officers on board and no SS. Now we know the Luftwaffe folks, uh, that's the German Air Force, but they were considered combatants, but they weren't Nazi f fanatics. They were not considered Nazi fanatics. There was a distinction between the two. The SS, of course, were the dastardly, most scumbag of the earth. They're the ones that operated the camps. Um, so I was always curious why they wouldn't put some kind of a Gestapo or SS or some kind of fanatic on that boat. And all of a sudden you've got this Luftwaffe guy and I'm thinking, well, he would be welcomed a lot easier and kept a lot easier.
There is that. There is also, and I, I tried to remember his name earlier, and it's still escaping me. And, and I can see the photo of his POW photo, but I just can't see his name underneath it. But there, the judge, right? The judge. Yeah, Nieschling. I can't think of his name either. K, I'm sorry. It just came to me. K. Nieschling. Okay, he was he was a Nazi Party judge, high-ranking Nazi Party judge, yeah. that they were sending to Japan to try Richard Onesor, who had been a spy over there. Well, he was a bona fide died in a role you know, Nazi Nishwing was. And I think just having a high level Nazi judge on that U boat, I don't think they needed anybody more than that because the he you know he could have done whatever he wanted to on there to anybody who was causing problems. And I, I think it obviously didn't hurt to have that Air Force the Luftwaffe guys, but but I I don't think they had any issues. And there was also here's another thing. The boat normally carried a crew of between fifty and fifty two. This particular boat had 63, a crew of 63. That doesn't count the, the passengers on it. That's just the crew. So the crew itself was obviously stocked, and we don't know who those extra guys were. Could very well have been OSS, Gestapo. Could have been anybody and probably were. Yeah, that's why I wonder if they were just getting off the boat as a, as an early part of Operation Paperclip. I don't know. I'm just, it's speculation, folks. Yeah. I don't know. The other thing that was mysterious, too, to me, and I, I'm not quite sure if I believe the traditional story that the two Japanese officers committed suicide because it was such it was going to be so dishonorable for them to surrender to the Americans because Japan was still at war with the Americans. I don't know. It sounds like maybe they had help committing suicide it could have been i i i i think it could have been it could have gone either way i you know i i know what Fayler wrote about what happened and also dr walter wrote and they you know yeah account, accounts aren't always perfectly identical but they're close enough that they they worked it out pretty well in advance if that's what happened i i i it could easily have happened that they were right dispatched up rather than they took care of themselves for them. And the uranium you traced to the bomb that took out Hiroshima. Correct. Well, it helped to take out Hir Hiroshima. Okay. Let's back up a second because I'm not... 30 uh, seconds, sorry. Oh, we almost... Okay, I'll go yeah, set. I apologize, Carter. The, the Manhattan Project was successful in enriching uranium. It just hadn't enriched enough to complete the bomb. And there's the music. We gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely critical mass, triple W dot night fright show. Our guest tonight, an incredible, incredible researcher, folks, Carter Heydrich. I urge you all to get it. Thank you so much, Carter. Thank you. All the best to you and yours. You too. I'm Brent Holland for Night Fright. See y'all later. Inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza. First person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com.